Hello, a very good evening to you. Welcome to Monday Night's Calendar. Hello, thanks for joining us. Here are tonight's main stories. Steel jobs under threat. More uncertainty for Scunthorpe's workforce, as unions say around 2,000 jobs are at risk as the company goes green. We're looking at 2,000 job losses. That isn't tomorrow, it isn't next week, it's not even next year. We're looking at two, three, maybe four years hence, but it's coming. Killed on the motorway, 10 years for the father who drunkenly walked his disabled son along the M62 before he was run down. Also on calendar tonight. Sent in towards Tom Naylor. And the former Portsmouth player puts Chesterfield ahead. Non-league Chesterfield dump out Portsmouth to make it through to the second round of the FA Cup. And cash in the attic, how selling antiques found in the home has become big business for some. First tonight, a steel union fears that around 2,000 jobs could be lost in Scunthorpe with the introduction of a new electric arc furnace, which British Steel says will make the company more sustainable. Well, while the £1.25 billion proposal to replace the current blast furnace was heralded by the company as the biggest transformation in its history, unions say the move will have a devastating impact. Well, British Steel has pledged to work with unions and North Lincolnshire Council to support employees affected by the plans. Well, Emma Haywood is in Scunthorpe for us. Emma, this is a town built on steel, isn't it? What reaction has there been today? I think there's a real sense of anger and uncertainty here. People just really wondering what the future of steel making looks like here in Scunthorpe. Of course, British Steel talking about a £1.25 billion investment here. But with that, people say there could be a much, much, much leaner workforce. Let's speak to Holly Mumbycroft, the MP here, and also Paul McBean, who is the community union leader here. Holly, what's your reaction to these plans? Well, I stand with the steel workers here in Scunthorpe tonight. I don't support these plans. I don't think it's the right thing. And what I'd like to see is the government taking that hundreds of millions of pounds of support that British Steel is asking them to provide and making sure they use that to protect the jobs here in Scunthorpe and to protect our ability to make primary steel here in the blast furnaces. And Paul, the rain tonight really reflects the mood, doesn't it? Because what happens in the perimeter fence, well, what happens behind that fence really affects the whole town, doesn't it? Yeah, like I say, I'm, I'm not here just to represent the steel workers, although that's my main concern. It's the town, it's the community, it, it's everything. This, it, this, I know it's three, four years away, but the uncertainty now, it's, it's back again. The uncertainty for the workforce and everybody in the town. And what have people been saying to you? Well, basically, uh, what's happening, where we're going, are they going to close the heavy end? You know, we need to be able to make primary steel. Everybody realises that. The backbenchers of the Conservatives realise that. Everybody seems to be able to get that message, except the company and the Prime Minister. OK, thank you both for joining us. Chris and Ian. Well, Emma, the Scun Scunthorpe Steel has certainly seen its ups and downs over the decades, hasn't it? But there are real worries this evening, aren't there? There are real worries and as you say it has seen its ups and downs. We have been here before talking about the future of this plant and every chapter it seems to bring pain and uncertainty <laughs> to the community here and we're not just talking about jobs we're talking about people's livelihoods, people's incomes so it is a very very difficult time for people here in Scunthorpe tonight. Emma Haywood live in Scunthorpe for us this evening. Next tonight, a father has been jailed for manslaughter after drunkenly walking his young autistic son along the M62 for 15 minutes before the boy was run over and killed. Yes, Callum Rycroft was struck by a car as he tried to cross the motorway behind his father near Cleckheaton this summer. It's after Matthew Rycroft had crashed his own car following a day of heavy drinking. Michael Billington is live at the M62 for us tonight. And Michael, the court heard that Rycroft seemed to show little interest in his son's safety. That's right, Ian. Court was shown footage of how the events of that afternoon and evening unfolded right up until, until just seconds before Callum was hit. They were seen on CCTV walking around half a mile along the hard shoulder here and a dash cam footage actually shows just how close they came to passing cars. In fact, it's thought Callum's father allowed his son to walk on the outside of him, so closest to the carriageway. 
as he staggered along beside. Callum's mother said Rycroft was meant to keep him safe and bring him home. Instead, he led his son to his death. He was, said his mother, a beautiful, happy soul. But it was the actions of his father that led to 12-year-old Callum Rycroft's death on the M62 one Saturday night in August. This is where their drive home ended after their car overturned on the eastbound slip road to Hartshead Moor Services. 37-year-old Matthew Rycroft had spent the afternoon drinking lager, spirits and several shots after visiting his parents in Huddersfield. Despite his father urging him not to get behind the wheel, he refused. When they called him to ask him to pull over, Callum could be heard in the background saying, Dad won't stop. Soon after, Rycroft's car was seen swerving across lanes on the M62 before hitting the crash barrier. That is when he made his failed attempt to leave the motorway. He and his son then crossed the carriageway, walking along the central reservation for up to a minute before inexplicably turning back. Rycroft went first, Callum then followed, running straight into the path of an oncoming vehicle. He died immediately. His father didn't even look back as he walked away along the hard shoulder. Well, the court heard how Rycroft was actually found hiding in undergrowth around two to three hundred yards away from where his son was hit. It was hours before he even asked how or where his son even was. And Michael, we heard more from Claire Bancroft today, didn't we? Callum's mother. Yes, that's right. She wasn't in court today, but in a statement she described how uh, Callum loved and trusted his dad and worshipped the ground he walked on. She said her former partner had torn the family apart, uh, but most importantly had let Callum down. And the judge told him, you were responsible for Callum and you are responsible for his death. Matthew Rycroft has been jailed for 10 years. Terribly sad story. Thank you. Michael Billington live there at Hartshead Moor Top. Next tonight, a jury's been hearing how a man talked a would-be bomber out of blowing up St James's Hospital in Leeds. Nathan Newby came across Mohammed Farouk outside the hospital on the night of January the 19th this year. Well, Mr Newby told Sheffield Crown Court Farouk told him he worked at the hospital and wanted to get them back for stabbing him in the back. Farouk then told him he had a bomb in a bag beside him. Sally Simpson reports. Giving evidence straight after working a night shift, Nathan Newby spoke quietly to confirm the details of the conversation he'd had with the defendant that night. Mr Newby was a patient at the hospital and was returning to the building when he saw Mohammed Farouk looking upset and distressed, the jury heard. Mr Newby asked him what was wrong and he said he had a grievance against the hospital he worked at. He also seemed preoccupied with the contents of a bag he had with him. What's in the bag, Mr Newby asked. It's just a bomb, said Farouk. He went on to say he intended to go into the hospital with it when it was full of nurses and set the bomb off. Mr Newby said he kept him chatting for several hours in an attempt to keep him calm until Farouk eventually asked him to call 999. When he asked Farouk if he had anything on him of concern, he produced a handgun, which later turned out to be imitation. Earlier in the trial, the jury was shown body cam footage from the armed officers who arrested Farouk as he calmly explained what he intended to do. There's a bag there, it's got a bomb in it. What's in it? There's a bomb inside. There's a bomb inside. Well, it's not live, it's not live. It's not what? It's There's not a live. bomb inside it, but it's not live. What is it? What's it made from? Pressure cooker. A pressure cooker. The court also heard how earlier that evening Farouk had downloaded voice changing technology to his mobile phone and had recorded three audio clips stating, There is a bomb on your ward. Evacuate everyone. Those messages were never sent. However, at 11.42, he sent a text message to a colleague, Emily Pritchard, who worked with him on Ward J28. I have placed a pressure cooker bomb on J28, it stated. It will detonate in one hour. Let's see how many lives you will save. It was more than an hour before Ms Pritchard read the message and contacted the police. Mohamed Farouk, who's 28, has pleaded guilty to a number of offences, including possessing a pressure cooker bomb with intent to endanger life or cause serious injury to property. He denies preparing acts of terrorism, and the trial continues. Sally Simpson, ITV News, Sheffield. And you're watching Monday's calendar still to come on the programme tonight, selling up how more and more people are cashing in on their old antiques. 
and it was all eyes on the skies for more reasons than one yesterday evening. Of course, there were plenty of fireworks, but there was also an aurora and something called Steve. I'll have more details and, of course, your photos and forecasts a little later on. More of the day's news now and a celebration of life is due to take place in America later in honour of ice hockey player Adam Johnson who died in what's been described as a freak accident at the Sheffield Arena. It comes after dozens of fans came together outside the venue in Sheffield to pay their respects yesterday. The 29-year-old Nottingham Panthers player who grew up in Minnesota died in hospital after a collision witnessed by 8,000 fans saw him sustain a fatal cut to his neck last Saturday. You never want to experience anything like that, nobody does, but I'm just so glad that we could all come together and stand by each other and stand by the person that it's happened to, the family that it's happened to and the player that's obviously involved as well. We stand by everyone that's been part of it. The inquest into the death of Gracie Spinks is continuing into its second week with evidence from a police sergeant who closed the stalking investigation into the man believed to have killed her. The 23-year-old was found with multiple stab wounds four months later and is believed to have been killed by a former colleague, Michael Sellers. Adam Fowler was at Chesterfield Coroner's Court for us. Today we heard from Sergeant Matthew Adams, an officer with 23 years experience. Last week we heard from Gracie Spinks. We heard the call that she made to the police after she was concerned about unwanted attention from Michael Sellers and after she'd found him waiting for her in a lay-by. She was visited then by PC Sarah Parker, as was Michael Sellers. But it's Matthew Adams who then uh, closed the case a few weeks later. He admitted today that the crime report he based that decision on wasn't very good. He said he'd had a conversation with PC Parker where they discussed the risk Sellers posed to Gracie and said it was an error that that hadn't been written down anywhere. He agreed the crime report lacks detail and the officer had failed in her duty to record, retain and reveal material. He also said that in hindsight, police should have requested a disciplinary file about Sellers' behaviour towards Gracie Spinks from his employer and that if they had, then they might have got him in for an interview. But he said when Gracie reported it, there had been nothing from Sellers for a month. There had been no contact. She had blocked him on social media. He went on, we felt the risk was relatively low because there had been no threats or violence. Well, this afternoon, we also heard from a DC Denise Sandal from the Major Crime Unit and she displayed a brown rucksack uh, that was found containing weapons. And we also heard the call that a member of the public made in May 2021 when she found that rucksack. It contained an axe, a hammer, two hunting knives, a folding knife and a handwritten note that said, don't lie. And we heard in court that member of the public tell police it's the piece of paper that said, don't lie, that made me think, oh my God. The inquest continues tomorrow. Adam Fowler, ITV News, Chesterfield Coroner's Court. OK, time for some sport now and a new manager in at Bradford City. Zero Accounting Software. Sponsors ITV Regional Sports Report. Well, Chris is here sat next to me, so it must mean Arif's got the sport for us tonight. Good evening, Arif. And evening. it's all go at Valley Parade. It is, and Bradford City have announced Graham Alexander as their new manager. The 52-year-old former Scunthorpe United manager takes over from Mark Hughes, who was sacked last month. Alexander has signed a two-and-a-half-year contract. His first game in charge will be this weekend at home to Barrow. Yeah, Leeds became only the second team to take points off Leicester in the Championship this season. Georgie New Ruta scored up in a 1-0 win. An injury depleted Huddersfield drew 0-0 with Watford. And substitute Georgie Kelly rescued a point for Rotherham against QPR. And Sheffield Wednesday were aggrieved at Barry Bannon sending off as the Owls were beaten 1-0 at Bristol City. Now, Chesterfield's reward for their giant killing win over Portsmouth yesterday is a home tie against Leighton Orient in the second round of the FA Cup. The Spyrites with the standout result of the first round weekend, but they're not the only team dreaming of a cup glory. There's two leagues in 48 places between non-league Chesterfield and Portsmouth. On the evidence of yesterday's performance, it was difficult to tell who played where. 
Tom Neal's headed goal was enough to dump his former employers out the cup. The, the performance was, was excellent. We obviously didn't dominate the ball at times when we, when we liked to, but um, like you said, they're a top, top side, top of League One at the moment and beaten, so for us to pull out a performance like that is, uh, is top class. Harrogate sunk Marine's hopes of a cup shock. The League Two side raced into an early lead and never looked back as they eased into round two. Non-league Scarborough were minutes away from causing an upset against Forest Green. Teacher Alex Wiles gave Borough the lead before teenager Oli Sully equalised deep into stoppage time. Barnsley were given a scare by part-time Horsham. 17-year-old Fabio Jallo showed quality and composure beyond his years to score the goal of the game. The Hornets though stung the tights late on to send this game to replay. A wasteful York City drew a blank against Chester. League One Wigan await the winners of this one. Doncaster Rovers will go again against Accrington. Not even Harrison Biggins' stunning long ring strike was enough to secure the win. 2 all the final score. Bradford crashed out as they fell to a 2 1 defeat to Wickham at Valley Parade. Mansfield suffered back to back defeats for the first time this season. They were beaten 2 1 by Wrexham at a drenched field mill. Whitby is the seaside town that inspired Dracula. But the 450 odd fans that went to their game against Bristol Rovers witnessed a bit of a horror show. Rovers sunk their teeth into the non league side, running out 7 2 winners. And Workshop Town gave as good as they got against Stockport. Jay Rollins' goal gave the travelling support something to cheer. In the end, the hosts eased to a 5 1 win. So that's the football, Arif, yes. but also it was a big weekend for rugby league. Yeah, it was international rugby league at that, Ian, as England's men's, women's and wheelchair teams were all in action. First up, it was the men who wrapped up a 3-0 series win over Tonga with a 26 points to 4 win. Leeds' his very own Harry Newman rounding off the scoring with his first international try. Probably the best feeling I've ever had in my life, if I'm honest. Um, can't, words can't quite describe it from the moment I got called up to receiving my first cap. So coming here at Headingley and winning 3-0, it's just magnificent. There was a dream debut for York's Lacey Owen as she ran in a try just moments after coming on as England's women ran riot against Wales, winning by 60 points to nil. Yeah, I'll give the credit to Tara for the, for the pass, for the try, but it's an amazing experience and obviously so many people watching and really like enlightening the women's game, so it was really nice. Yeah. But sadly, the weekend ended with defeat for England's wheelchair team at the Leeds Arena. France getting revenge for defeat in last year's World Cup final with a 43 points to 34 win. Two out of three is not bad, though, is it, for the, for the rugby team? <laughs> can't win them all, can you, Arif? Well, no, you can't, unfortunately. Cheers, Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Now, the ITV News continues at 6.30. The Scunthorpe Steel story also making national headlines. Here's a look at what's happening with Mary Nightingale. Coming up on the programme, the death toll passes 10,000 in Gaza after Israel carried out one of its heaviest bombardments overnight. Israeli military says it has now surrounded Gaza City, with the country's media reporting soldiers will enter within 48 hours. Here, 2,000 jobs are on the brink as British Steel plans to close its blast furnaces in Scunthorpe. And a forever home for Fiona, the UK's loneliest sheep. We'll do John Mead for those stories and more at 6 30. Thanks very much, Mary. We certainly will. Thank you. Now then, Kerry is here. And Kerry, did you have a lovely bonfire night? Uh, no, I was stuck on a train. Oh, oh, what? I know. And we got an alert saying there was going to be an aurora borealis, and I was stuck on a train. Good heavens. Oh, I know. It's a good job we've got some great viewers. <laughs> I've <laughs> some pictures. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, weather-wise, we looked out last night. Dry and clear for many. Um, so it, it really did look nice. I'm not sure if Holly Rushton was up at the Cowan Calf in Ilkley to take a shot of the bonfire night or the Aurora, but she managed both. So a big thank you to Holly for sharing. And also, Stephen took one as well. Absolutely fabulous. My fave photo, I think, of the inbox today, weather photos at ITV.com. So, yeah, absolutely gorgeous. But it was really seen far south actually as far as Kent and Cornwall. This was in Towton, North Yorkshire. A big thank you to Lee Todd. I mean, you can see the fireworks and stuff at, at ground level, but lots of pinks and greens. Uh, and this one was by Simon and Nicole of Astro Dog at Jackson's Bay in Scarborough. Absolutely fantastic. But you might not have seen the Aurora, but you might have seen something else because it was seen around the region. This little stripe of sort of pinky white cloud or like a ray and then behind it, some sort of purple, which was a little bit fainter. Uh, one of our photographers for PA Press Association 
Association, Owen Humphreys, thank you Owen for letting me sh share this, uh, took it a little bit further north than east and you can see that, I mean if I'd seen that in the sky it's absolutely amazing. Sci-fi film it's isn't it? It's very rare, it was only named in 2016 and it's apparently, it's new to me, it's called Steve, Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement. Try and remember that, everybody. <laughs> it works in a similar way to the aurora. It often happens at the same time of that, but it's like a ribbon of hot gas as opposed to the charged particles that we get with the aurora um, sort of uh, enhanced by uh, coming into our atmosphere, if you like. So, yes, aurora, watch out for Steve. I don't Steve, think we'll see it tonight. Aurora, Steve. Aurora, Steve. I think I prefer Steve. <laughs> aurora for me. You know what? Sure. She's been talking about Steve all day. I, I don't know what she's been talking about. It's a big deal. Yeah, Steve. Now we know. who he was. Anyway, yeah, thanks, guys. I'll see you shortly. Yes. Now, finally tonight, do you have a fortune in the front room or the attic? Uh, Chris, what have you got in your loft? Uh, a few dusty Christmas decorations, uh, nothing much else. Really. Nothing of any value, I don't so like to speak. going up into the loft, because last time I did, there was a rat up there. Oh, be worth, that won't be worth And much, I'm not right? joking, it was uh, awful. <laughs> well, new figures show more and more of us are getting involved in the antiques trade in the hope of making a quick bit of cash. And with hundreds of millions of pounds of potential treasure thought to be gathering dust in our homes, our reporter Raheem Rashid has been looking at the lucrative ways you can find a fortune that could be hidden in your furniture. We've all heard of cash in the attic, but might you quite literally be sitting under a gold mine? More of us are making money from antiques hidden in our homes in plain sight. One dealer in Ghoul says people of all ages are getting involved. I even had a young boy in the other day when he visits Ghoul, he always makes a point of asking his mum if he can come to the vintage shop. But we have a lot of young couples coming as well, been setting up home and they're wanting um, old furniture. It's a lot cheaper as well to buy and it's well made. You know, it's stood this test of time. Data from Google shows a 110% increase in searches for antique and furniture shops near me, while figures from Auction House show a 441% increase in the number of 18 to 24 year olds interested in online auctions. So if you're looking to make a little bit of money out of things that might be lying around your house, who better than to speak to Mark Francis Vandelli, who joins us now. Now, you're a reality star on Made in Chelsea. When can a baby start walking? No, no, no. Walk. Keep it on its knees until it knows everything about antique furniture and not to pee on the floor. But you also have links in the antiquing world. How did you kind of get into it? Not out of choice. Um, as a child, my parents, rather than leave me at home with nanny, would take me everywhere with them. And that mostly meant auction houses, antique shops. So why don't you take us through some of the things that you might have lying around your house then that could be of value? So take this Cartier mystery clock. This was in a thousand pieces when I bought it. We restored it and it's like new. So if you just, if you see, you, you can, can see only... right through it. Yeah. And then at some point, you can see the time. The time appears. Yeah. So those pieces of crystal were completely destroyed, but something that is historical can generally be restored. And have you had any cases in recent weeks of people coming up to you that might have something of value, but it's actually turned out to be a hidden gem? Oh, yeah. A friend of mine took a photograph of a dinner gong, of all things I know, obscure to say the very least. We put it in Google Lens and it turned out there was one for sale for seven times the price. How much? It was £200 and 1800 So, while we may not all have a dinner gong and Cartier clock lying around in our living rooms, here's hoping you might now be able to turn something old into a little bit of gold. Raheem Rashid, ITV News. I can guarantee there's no dinner gongs or Cartier clocks in my loft, not even in my house. Even really? You do surprise me. I'm yeah. really surprised. I <laughs> had you down for all of that. You, likewise. Well, you I'm must not sure have. about that. I'm not sure about that. In Kerry's, abundance. Kerry's very posh, though, so uh, here she is with the forecast. <laughs> Good visibility on the horizon. Tui sponsors ITV Yorkshire Weather. 
Thank you. Hello again. Yes, definitely rainbow weather across the region today and pretty much for the rest of this week, apart from Wednesday morning, when we'll have a spell of rain. Beautiful autumn colours at the start of the Coldedale Way. Big thank you to John Lawrence for sharing. And yes, more than just a few rainbows around the region today with that mixture of sunny spells, yes, but also some showery outbreaks. Feeding along this west northwesterly flow today, developing in clusters and pushing from west to east. But either side, lovely dose of sunshine and just bright and breezy across many parts of the region. Over Tonight, tonight, still the risk of a shower here and there, but many places will be dry with clear spells. Misty and murky and quite showery right over the tops as we head into the early hours and the showers get going again, but under the clearer skies, in shelter from the wind, temperatures down into the low single figures. So a fresh enough start as we head into tomorrow. 7.17 and 4.22 are your sun times for Tuesday. Again, tomorrow, a similar day to today, some decent sunny spells. There will be a few showers becoming quite uh, widespread into the afternoon, but well scattered so anyone could get one but most places will escape and as we head into the afternoon in the sunshine 12 celsius about the average always quite breezy and blustery where we get any heavier showers as we head into wednesday morning Watch out, wet and windy, particularly for the rush hour, but it will whip through quite quickly. And then some decent sunny spells with just a few scattered showers for the second half of Wednesday. So actually much improved into the afternoon compared to the morning. That leaves us with a showery theme though, as we head into Thursday and some of the showers could be heavy, maybe even thundery, but we are expecting the winds to drop out. Some cold nights to come, especially by the end of the week on Friday, but Friday at this stage, dry and bright. Tui, sponsors ITV Yorkshire Weather. There you go, some clear spells tonight, but less chance of seeing Aurora or Steve, I'm oh, afraid. I'd quite like to see Steve tonight. Yeah, yeah I too. didn't see him last night, mm. so why not? Hey, yeah. never mind Steve when you can have Ian White at half past <laughs> ten. How about that for the late news? That'll be fun, won't it? Have a great evening. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> That'll be nice.